and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce to you a fellow that I met about a year or so ago when I was making plans for a, a, a May trip. Our speaker, Ben Kim, was born and raised in Saratoga region of New York State. He is a living historian, speaker, and researcher who has been featured on C-SPAN, PBS, National Park Service programs, and the 2020 History Channel documentary about Ulysses S. Grant. And he's been assigned to the uh, summer home since 2014. Ben is chosen for his topic tonight, a Yankee galvanized Yankee, the man who fought on both sides of the Civil War. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, Ben Kemp. Thank you so much. Uh, and I, I really appreciate um, uh, Al and, and the General Lander uh, Civil War Roundtable for having me on uh, this evening. Uh, it's always a, a wonderful opportunity to share uh, the research um, and the interesting stories that I come across. Uh, sometimes that's uh, uh, during my association with uh, Grant Cottage as a historic site. And in this case, it's actually not. Um, it was in my association with the uh, Hadley Lake Luzerne. Those are two townships just down the road from me in the Southern Adirondack Mountains. Uh, the Hadley Lake Luzerne uh, Historical Society. I was a board member for a few years and uh, this individual that we'll be talking about tonight had an association there. Um, but of course, I wanna recognize the uh, Civil War Roundtable there um, for the uh, very important work that you do uh, to keep the Civil War era alive, keep it uh, in people's minds, uh, to remember those, uh, the sacrifices that were made, and just to appreciate uh, the history of it uh, that much more. So I really appreciate the role uh, that your organization plays. Uh, and, and my fascination with the uh, Civil War really is a little different than some people. As some people are a little bit more fascinated with uh, the battles, the leaders, uh, and I, I do work at a leader's uh, final home, uh, and he was writing about the Civil War there. Uh, but for me, I became a Civil War reenactor when I was a teenager. You know, Ken Burns' Civil War series, the Glory, Gettysburg, the movies, uh, everybody was interested. But what really fired my imagination, especially about those movies, was the really the stories that came out of the, out of the common soldier. And some of them were complex, you know, depending on the background of that soldier. And, and, and tonight's story is going to be like that. It's going to be, a, you know, particularly in, focused on an individual soldier who had an incredibly, incredibly unique uh, Civil War experience from what I, you know, from my research. I haven't found anyone else uh, in the annals of the Civil War history that had the exact same experience. Um, every, everyone's unique, but this one's a little more unique. <laughs> We'll put it that way. I'm really, really glad to have, this is not a luxury you get every time when researching Civil War soldiers, to have a photograph of them, especially a photograph uh, during the wartime. I was so fortunate to find this photograph when I started researching the individual and I reached out to the owner and they gave me permission to use it, which was wonderful. And uh, he looks like such a young man, doesn't he? This is, this is Hugh Clemens. This is gonna be our main character tonight of this story. And again, just to be able to look into the face of the individual we're talking about, uh, it's it's very important. You know, the, the internet has really made research so much better. And, and this is a great example of that. It's so much more evocative to look at this uh, young man. I, I believe in this photograph, uh, he's somewhere around 20, but to me, he looks like he's about 16. I, <laughs> I don't know, maybe I'm just getting old. So that's Hugh Clemens. And we're going to certainly, we're going to learn uh, some about him and his unique tale. So where does Hugh Clemens come from? Uh, where does he originate? Well, he was born in uh, July of 1842, uh, and he is a native of New England. <laughs> so I figured I'd bring that up. Just barely, though. If you, if you can see the photograph on the left, there's a map showing the, the very, very uh, western county, uh, Rutland County in Vermont, uh, right by the New York border. So just about as far west in New England as you can get uh, in a little uh, farming town called Wells, which I've actually been to and, and, and been part of a reenactment there once uh, years ago. So I'm familiar with it. Uh, he didn't spend too much time there. That was just his very young childhood. And um, 
he was he moved not too far, but but certainly over the border into New York. Um, he had five sisters and one older brother, uh, Martin Van Buren. Uh, uh, Clemens was his name, and and he was born during uh, that president's um, tenure. But he he, uh, he he'll come back in our story a little bit later. We'll talk about Hugh's older brother. His fa father uh, Hugh's father was a farmer and a Methodist minister. Uh, they settled in a, a place called Ferguson Hollow, but it's it's only probably about 10 miles north of where I live, uh, in just in the southern Adirondacks, in a place called uh, Lake Luzerne, and uh, there is a lake there, and that's where the, the two major rivers of the Adirondacks come together there, uh, the Hudson and the Sacandaga, and it's a massive, uh, it was massively important for the uh, timber trade. Uh, back in the 19th century, so uh, they would float the logs down the river and then process them. So it was a it was a huge uh, timber area, but there was a lot of other uh, industry going on as well. And that's where he's going to spend his childhood, really in the in the streams, the forests, you know, and and having a fairly normal childhood, from what I can tell. Not a lot of information left from that time period. Coincidentally, it's only going to be about 10 miles uh, as the crow flies from where Hugh Clemens grew up was uh, was raised more or less uh, in Luzerne to Grant Cottage on Mount McGregor. So it's a very short distance and that's going to play into our story uh, towards the very end actually. This is where it gets really strange and the mystery comes in here and I'm going to warn you that uh, even with you know five, six, seven years of research on this, uh, the research continues. There are some ma major, major uh, mysteries still in this uh, as as you may know, people that aren't quite as prominent individuals, characters in our history, well, they just don't have as much uh, of a paper trail usually. <laughs> and uh, if they didn't leave a diary or, or a lot of correspondence, then we really have to go with just the basics that we can glean off of, uh, you know, different genealogical information uh, and census records, things like that. And that's what I've done here uh, for the most part. And one thing I found out was that as a very young man, uh, in 1858, just a few years before the war breaks out, Hugh is going to move to Valdosta, a, a brand new, I mean, brand new county seat uh, in Lowndes County in southern Georgia. Uh, he's going to move there with his sister, Martha, his older sister, and his brother-in-law, Elijah Ives. For what reason? Absolutely unknown. Absolutely unknown. Um it, it, they're moving from the mountains of, of northern New York to the coastal plains of southern Georgia. I mean, they're only 13 miles from the Florida border and they're, they're 60 miles from the, the Gulf of Mexico. I mean, this is way down there, a completely different environment. Uh, it, it must have been an incredible shock, but the, the place was growing. There was a new railroad coming to town. Again, it was becoming the county. It was named the county seat. Uh, so there was a lot of potential going on there, a lot of activity, a lot of people moving into the area. Uh, so it was a flurry of activity just before the Civil War. D to give you an idea of the culture shock, I mean, you're talking about uh, a county that's predominantly a cotton producing area, and the population of the county was 50% enslaved individuals. There was, there would be a quite, it was a, definitely a different environment than they, than they had uh, been born and raised in. Now, I have found no connections between the Ives family, the Clemens family, and anyone in Georgia. Uh, so it, it remains a, an incredible mystery, uh, literally, you know, thousands, of, a thousand miles, <laughs> at least, uh, between the, um, the, the two points. I did find recently a couple of individuals in the town that did have some ties to Vermont and New York, some, so they owned a, uh, some sort of a business in town, I think it was a, a hotel or a boarding house. So maybe I'll go down that road and see if there's any connections. So it wasn't unknown that there was a northerner that would move into a place like this, but it was predominantly, according to the census records, it was mostly native-born southerners and Georgians in this area of southern Georgia. Uh, so you would have stuck out a little bit, of, like a little bit of a sore, sore thumb, um, you know, with, with, with their northern accent. Uh, their Yankee accent would have been apparent. What are they going to do down there? What what are they What are they going to do? Well, Hugh is very young, and and I would imagine not. 
I, there's no evidence that he had any particular trade when he went down there that I know of. But he he went into the um, he worked at a mill and, and was working as a cooper. And so he's building pails, ba barrels, or whatever they had him doing in the in, in that, you know, just basic manual labor, more or less, semi-skilled. And then uh, Elijah is an interesting character. He's going to open up uh, a confectionery, which which kind of you know it, it deals with sweets, possibly uh, some some pastries, maybe even some baked goods, depending on the size of the business. And that's what he's going to do. He's going to be a southern the candy man basically of town in this new town. He's going to live in a town just next door um, called Quitman uh, by the 1860 census. So they've kind of split a bit. He's not, Clement Hugh is not living with his uh, sister and brother-in-law. He's living on his, uh, he's living kind of boarding at the mill more or less uh, in Valdosta. And they're about 18 miles away uh, to the west in uh, Quitman. But close enough where obviously they can, you know, still interact with each other, and they obviously did. But it's a place where you can't hide that you're a Yankee. There's no, <laughs> there's no, no question. It really fires the imagination. What was it like for them to live in this in this kind of alien environment? You know, at that time, uh, just prior to the Civil War, because anyone who studies Civil War history knows that there was already a, a, a you know, substantial political and social cultural divide between the North and the South. And then in this time, you also have discussions about uh, secession and war going on even even prior to, to you know, 6061. Uh, so they would have, I don't know how much it was talked about in the town. Who knows uh, if it was a subject there, but it's interesting to think about. Now, the fact that they were in Georgia is one mystery. The second big mystery is why did they stay? Why did they stay past the point that may have seemed like a, a point of danger? So you have on the left uh, is a illustration of this exciting new railroad coming to town. It's going to boost business. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, it was a growing community. It says Railroad Jubilee at Valdosta. But right below it, and this is in August of 1860, it says disunion upon the event of Lincoln's election. So you 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 know, as this exciting you know community uh, uh, information is being posted, also this this incredibly sobering and serious discussion of of secession and disunion, and so that's right on the on the same page. So obviously that would have both would have been the talk of the town at the time. So they're going to stay. You have the Georgia decides to secede in January of 1861. And you can see the ordinance of secession on the right. And so they weren't the, the very first to to secede, but they were fairly early on. And Georgia is, you know, at that point, um, what's going through their heads? What's going through Hugh's head uh, and his brother-in-law, uh, Elijah? What are they thinking at this time? One easy, uh, why, why were they going to stay? Well, You've obviously got Elijah established in business. He's been there a couple of years. Uh, he, you know, it, it's not a small thing in that time and age to walk away from a, a business that you've, uh, an enterprise you've set up. So I think that could be part of it. Also, there were, as most people know that studied the Civil War and in, in the beginnings of it, there was a, a fairly large component of people, both North and South, that thought that it wouldn't be much. There wouldn't be much to this. The, you know, in the South, there was a lot of talk of we're just going to make a, you know, we'll threaten uh, will posture uh, and then and then you know the north will relent and allow the secession and and but there was there was a lot of people that didn't take it as seriously and and perhaps Hugh and Elijah because they had invested something uh, down there of themselves and, and created a, a bit of a life and probably some friends down in that area in in southern Georgia they probably didn't just want to up and walk away from that unless they absolutely had to but their decision to stay in southern Georgia was certainly going. Uh, to affect their lives uh, dramatically over the next few years. So what do they get for staying in Southern Georgia? <laughs> well, all we have, we have some records that start up in early 62, but uh, we have the uh, claims later on of Hugh himself, uh, who claims that him and his brother-in-law were pressed into the Confederate service. And, you know, the term pressed into uh, is, is, 
uh, somewhat vague. I mean, it's vague to a point where, you know, we don't know all the conditions. Now, the enlistments that happened, the, the uh, recruitment enlistments that happened in southern Georgia at this time were part of the building up uh, the 13th Georgia Infantry, and that was the Piscola Volunteers. It's it's all a little confusing because the state accidentally made a second 13th Georgia and sent them to Virginia, and, and they're both trying to be the 13th Georgia at once. So eventually they would um, uh, be combined, at least the portion that Elijah and Hugh would be in would end up, uh, that 13th Georgia would be uh, part of it that they were in would be would be uh, melded into the 26th Company C of the 26th Georgia Infantry uh, by early of 1862. Now, it's possible, we don't have any records to prove it, but Hugh and Elijah may have been pressed into the service as far back as the summer of 1861. We, we don't have any records from there all the way till early 62. So were they part of the 13th? 13th spent time at uh, St. Simon's Island, right on the coast of Georgia. Uh, they didn't go into any active service before uh, 62. Uh, but they, we know they were. Uh, they, it's possible that they were uh, with the unit at that time. It's also possible that it it came around the time of the uh, Conscription Act, which was in 1862. Uh, so the Conscription Act uh, was was uh, in April 1862, and it required all residents 18 to 35 to serve three years for the duration of the war. For those who voluntary and voluntarily enlisted before they were conscripted. Uh, if I can say that right, there was a $50 bounty. Now, one thing that's telling in, in Hugh's record when it starts in May of 1862 is there was no bounty listed. So <laughs> that may, may lay, lend some credence to the fact that he did not enlist. Uh, whether he was conscripted or not, that's debatable. Uh, he was above 18, 18 or over, obviously, and below 35, and so was his brother-in-law. So uh, they could be that they were conscripted, and, that, and that's what he termed as being pressed. Uh, into the service, I'm not sure. So that's going to be an, another little mystery. Uh, but it does seem as though uh, he didn't, you know, at least his claims seem to be honest later in his life that he really did not want to be <laughs> part of the war uh, in that in that way. <clears throat> so they had been, uh, they were set up 130 miles, as I mentioned, on the coast, 130 miles uh, east of uh, where they were living. Once they're in this environment, no, no matter how they got there, what what is what is it like for you? What did what what's it like? How did he get along day to day with his fellow soldiers? I would I would have to you know was there a desire to escape immediately? Did he have was he concerned about his life? Is 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 you know brother in law's life? What what was the concern here? And, and and it's hard to imagine. He said it wasn't willing, so there obviously was some you know some reticence for him to serve. And so you have to think he's going to probably treat the people around him with normal respect. I would imagine just as you know, fellow soldiers, but at the same time, did those soldiers look on him a different way because he was a Yankee? Did they mistrust him? Uh, so there's a lot that goes into it um, and, and really uh, kind of plays to that idea that the Civil War, as we know, was not as clear cut. There was a lot of gray areas. Uh, and in this case, gray and blue. They're going to get they're going to get organized and be sent north and they're going to be up there in, in 62 uh during the Peninsula Campaign, they're going to see their first action in pretty pretty quickly. I mean, within a couple of weeks of arriving in Virginia, uh, they're going to be part of the Peninsula Campaign. Uh, you know, countering McClellan's push up the Peninsula. The regiment at the time was at full strength, 1100. Uh, their their commander on the uh, right there is is uh, at the time it, it would become a brigadier. It was. Brigadier General Alexander Law, and he would become a Brigadier General. And coincidentally, he would die in upstate New York. <laughs> Out of all, all, uh, and he was a West Pointer, though. He had gone to West Point, but he was a Southern man. The largest brigade in the Army at the time, it was actually made up of five Georgia regiments. Uh, and they were assigned to, uh, not a hard guess there, we see Mr. Stonewall Jackson to the left. Uh, he was part of, they were part of the uh, Stonewall Brigade. I'm sorry, Stonewall Jackson's Corps, I should say at this time. So Jackson ended up arriving late at the Battle of Gaines Mill in late June. Uh, the, the 26th would be a part of an evening assault uh, on the Union lines, uh, but it wasn't a, it wasn't a, a, you know, there was certainly, it would have been seeing the elephant, as they say, uh, their first combat experience, but uh, it, it wasn't a particularly costly battle for the regiment or the brigade. Again, all these questions rush into your mind when you're dealing with someone in this predicament. Hugh 
who doesn't want to be there, but he is. He finds himself in this place he probably never dreamed he'd be. And then he's got northern men. He knows there's northern men on the other side of the battlefield, and they're shooting at him. <laughs> and, you know, was the training enough? Uh, how much, you know, how much fear was there? Was there a strange sense of uh, uh, morality uh, or was it just survival? I mean, what, what were these things? And I, I think that's what fires my imagination the most is, is you know, what was Hugh uh, thinking at these moments, especially his first time uh, facing the gun, which is terrible enough. Uh, Ulysses S. Grant, you know, uh, would, would say his first, you know, you know, he was... Uh, uh, certainly not as brave as you think on his first uh, meeting uh, in um, in the Mexican War, his first combat experience, you know, <laughs> with the bullets whizzing around. So th this is going to be a fairly light introduction as the Civil War terms goes to to that. But that's not going to be the case uh, in in August. In August, they're going to have a, a, a terrible fight. It's on the evening of the 28th of August. Uh, at Bronner's Farm. This was the opening engagement of the Second Battle of Bull Run. This is going to be a ferocious fight at Bronner's Farm. The, 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 the two sides are battling furiously, less than 100 yards apart from each other, uh, just, just for hours, neither side, side letting up. General McClellan is actually com commented actually on the brigade of the Union Brigade that was made up of Western soldiers uh, that was opposite uh, Lawton's Brigade. Uh, where Hugh was, saying uh, that they they must be made of iron. And that's going to earn them the, the famous moniker, the Iron Brigade. So Lawton's Brigade is going to face the Iron Brigade. And as you can see in the in the in the uh, map there, you can see that the 76 New York was was uh, was, you know, on the same area of the battlefield as the 26 Georgia. So you had New York troops, <laughs> not just northern troops, New Yorkers, fellow New Yorkers uh, right across uh, on the other side of the battlefield. So I'll, I'll share a little um, excerpt of the experience uh, because again, we don't have Hughes letters, we don't have exact experience, so we take the battle report and this gives us a little idea of what Hugh would have experienced uh, at his first massive uh, bloody conflict. Uh, it must have been terrifying. It's, this is from the Savannah Republican. He says, it says, while well, the opportunity presents itself, I cannot refrain from writing a few lines commemorative of the gallantry of the 26th Georgia Regiment upon the bloody and well-contested field of Manassas on Thursday, the 28th of August, 1862, just before dark, on the evening of the 28th, the 26th was drawn up in line of battle in a skirt of woods near the battlefield. We marched steadily across an open field for four or 500 yards through which the balls were flying by thousands without firing a single shot. Men were constantly falling from the ranks, but our brave Georgians wavered not. As a man fell, his place was immediately filled by another, and the regiment moved steadily to the front. As we neared the enemy, General Jackson rode up behind the brigade and urged us by the memory of our noble state to one bold stroke, and the day would be ours. And gallantly did the brave men to whom he was speaking obey his orders. Volley after volley was poured into the ranks of the enemy with terrible effect. Still, they held their ground, and our ranks kept getting thinner and thinner. After firing several rounds, General Lawton gave orders for the brigade to fix bayonets and charge the enemy. At the command, every man bounded over a fence which separated the, them from the enemy and with the true Georgia yell, rushed upon them. Then it was that the 26th suffered so terribly. Men fell from the ranks by dozens, still they wavered not. It was a heart-sickening sight to me as I gazed upon the regiment when formed after the battle. The 26th Georgia, lost 12 commissioned officers and 125 non-commissioned officers and privates. To give you a, a, an idea, uh, that sounds dramatic, and, and it is. And, and a lot of times these accounts, you know, obviously try to put it in the most gallant light, but there's no getting around it. The statistics don't lie. The 26th Georgia sustained an absolutely staggering 74% casualty rate uh, at Bronner's Farm. And to think that this is their second engagement that's that's like irish brigade level <laughs> you know you know like you know that's that's incredible um if anybody knows anything about the irish brigade they were uh, recklessly brave we'll put it that way and so there's no question hugh statistically was lucky to make it out of this conflict a lot whether or not he let out the georgia yell i don't know i don't know if he really had it in him 
uh, but but certainly uh, he, he did what he needed to to survive. So that was an incredible baptism of fire for, you know, literally only a couple months after they had left the seacoast in Georgia. They're, they're, they're facing this massive bloody battle. And of course, this, the fall rolls around and they're on to the next terrible day in the Civil War, which is the Battle of Antietam in, uh, in Sharpsburg, Maryland. And so You've got Robert E. Lee's making his foray uh, into northern soil. It kind of begs the question, and, and I'll bring this up later, though, what, you know, that, you know, this is getting pretty close to Union territory. If you are, you, you, and you do have a, you know, kind of an urge to escape, this might be an opportunity, but we don't see it happening here. There's going to be this, the, the battle at uh, Antietam, as you can see in the, in the map, Lawton's Brigade is in the center of the action there. Uh, you've got... Uh, a whole line of New Yorkers <laughs> that they're facing. So uh, again, they're they're uh, looking at uh, New Yorkers on the on the battlefield across from them. I'll read a, a again a little excerpt. So at 10 p.m. on the 16th, Lawton's brigade advanced from its position west of the Dunker Church and relieved Wa Wofford's brigade of Hood's division in the fields south of the cornfield and east of the Hagerstown Pike. Skirmishers were thrown forward in the south edge of the cornfield. In this position, the brigade was attacked at about 5:30 a.m on the 17th by Seymour's Brigade of Meade's division on the right, and at 6 a.m. by three brigades of Doubleday's division on the left. After losing its commander and more than one half its members, it was relieved by Wolford's Brigade of Hood's division and withdrawn to the woods southwest of the Dunker Church and was not again engaged. So it, it in a seemingly very short period of time, there was incredible, uh, another battle where they sustained inc incredible casualties. Uh, which, which um, uh, again, uh, only a coming only a, a month after, uh, barely a month after, if not even uh, after their their terrible ordeal in Virginia. Uh, here they are in Maryland uh, having another trial by fire. You have 30 miles south of the Pennsylvania border, so you're in a you know border state, you know Maryland, and then you have Pennsylvania only 30 miles north. So it you know there was an opportunity perhaps there. Uh, not sure if the just the time wasn't right. I guess I mean the, the battlefield's a dangerous place. There's going to be some other hardships besides battle that Hugh and his comrades, I guess you can call them comrades, his fellow soldiers, uh, Confederate soldiers, are going to uh, suffer. And that's on the campaign in 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 1862 in the fall and the winter of 1862. Now there's a lot of, as you know, there's a lot of. Uh, there was suffering in the Civil War, obviously, but there was a lot of exaggeration that goes on sometimes in reports and things. Obviously, if you want to get, uh, you kind of think of uh, what the movie Glory, and he goes in to get the supplies, the shoes, and he's like, you better give me the shoes, you know, that famous scene. You know, the idea was there there, there was uh, issues with supply uh, of basic needs, clothing items, and that, was, you know, obviously, 26 Georgia was not... Um, immune to that. James Blaine, um, and again, you've got the biggest killer in the Civil War lurking there too, which is disease, of course, and and so, uh, and any kind of uh, clothing issues and all that feeds into the possibility of getting sick, malnourishment, um, exposure, uh, all that's going to play into it. And James S. Blaine, Captain of Company A, 26 Georgia, writes uh, to the Savannah Republican, essentially writing home, uh, dear sir, we are frequently surprised by receiving letters from home congratulating us upon being so well prepared uh, for a winter campaign in Virginia. This is probably true in, with regard to most of the Georgia troops in Virginia, but in reference to Lawton's Brigade, it is far from the truth. Lawton's Brigade is composed of the 13th, 26th, 31st, 38th, 60th, and 61st Georgia regiments, and I venture to assert that a more gallant set of men were never embodied under one command. At the last report from our brigade, we had 705 men without shoes, and there are numbers without a single blanket to shelter them from the cold. This is no fiction, but a simple statement of the truth. Georgians, think of this. Think of such a number of these men who have aided in making the name of Georgia illustrious, whether they wanted to or not, marching 20 and 25 miles per day with nothing to shelter their feet from the contact with the snow, frost, and rocks and without a blanket to shelter them from the chilling blast at night, and this too, without a murmur at their hard fate. Now, there's probably a few murmurs, but I'll forgive them on that, you know? So <laughs> where the soldiers didn't have anything to do if they didn't have a little complaining to do. So you, you think of the bonding experience that probably occurred with Hugh through these hardships, 
that did just naturally happen? Does it mean he, he believes fully in what he's doing? Uh, is, is he really uh, believe in the Southern cause? No, but he, he has the basic uh, probably human sympathy for his, his fellow human next to him that's suffering and shivering through the night just as he has. Did he form close fr friendships? Uh, there's obviously no records that he reached out to anybody from his former unit after, you know, uh, the Southern unit after the war, but uh, he, he could have uh, formed some friendships that ended with the other individual dying. Hugh himself is going to have a, a very close brush uh, while he's still got the gray uniform on. He's going to have a brush with death at uh, Fredericksburg on Decem in December of 62. His luck is going to run out after those two horrific fights. Um, we don't know what the wound was. We have the records to show that he, he was wounded uh, severely enough that he needed a 20-day furlough for recovery. He was granted a 20-day uh, furlough for recovery. Um, and so, so that's what we know. So he certainly did, uh, did receive a wound of some kind. We know it was a wound and not, a, um, and not just an illness. Uh, it was actually a wounding. So Fredericksburg, uh, again, this, the, obviously these Georgians were involved in, in most of the major conflicts here going on in Virginia uh, in the Eastern Theater here. Battle of Chancellorsville, Lawton's Brigade, uh, and this is in May of 63, so he survives through the winter. Uh, and in 63, uh, the Lawton's Brigade was transferred to, uh, as you can see there, John B. Gordon's uh, Brigade, uh, who coincidentally was, a, uh, was a, an attendee at uh, Ulysses S. Grant's funeral in 1885 in New York City. Uh, they fought at Chancellorsville and, and Second Winchester uh, in the spring of, of 63. We'll move on from that. And this is where it gets really interesting. So after that um, battle, we're going to have Hugh taking an opportunity. The Gettysburg campaign is going on. This is the first time uh, they're really, you know, stepping foot on true northern soil in, in, in Pennsylvania. And Hugh's going to take this opportunity to escape the Confederate Army. He, he probably picked the, you know, an opportune time because <laughs> He he uh, slunk away, maybe in the night, we don't know, uh, from uh, the Confederate forces uh, as they approached Gettysburg. Uh, so this is prior to Gettysburg. He's going to be picked up on July 3rd, the, the third day of the battle, at Hanover, Pennsylvania, about 13 miles uh, from the terrible carnage going on uh, in Gettys at Pickett's Charge at Gettysburg. So uh, you think about uh, as he's getting, as he's surrendering, uh, depending on the location, 13 miles, he probably was hearing the guns, uh, the massive cannonade that, that, that happened uh, just prior to, to the uh, Pickett's, to Pickett's charge on the field of Gettysburg. Because he's got, uh, he, <laughs> what, nobody trusted anybody. It was a civil war, right? It, you, you couldn't trust anybody. Everybody's Americans, but you've got people, you know, with Northern accents and Southern accents. I mean, you know, Ulysses S. Grant had a wife that owned slaves. You know, there was a lot of distrust and, and, it, and it took quite a bit. So to have somebody, I can imagine them arresting him, right, or, or capturing him in his Confederate uniform and saying, boy, you really don't sound like you're from Southern Georgia. I don't think he'd spend enough time down there to, to, to pick up the accent. Maybe he did. I don't know. But he, he probably didn't sound like it. But you, you can't say, oh, I'm just playing dress up for the day. They take him over to Baltimore, and he's going to be put confined at Fort McHenry with other prisoners of war uh, from the Gettysburg campaign, mainly. Uh, so he's at Fort McHenry first, but then he's shortly after sent to Fort Delaware. He immediately made his situation known that he was a northerner. He was pressed into the service. He told the authorities that it was reported that he did, and that he intended. Interest, you know, this is one of the most important points. He intended. Uh, to join the Union Army. Didn't necessarily have to. And then we get into the subject of galvanized. It did happen both ways. Uh, there were Northern soldiers that galvanized and became Confederates. Uh, most of the time, galvanizing occurred, uh, uh, taking swearing oath of allegiance to the other side and serving in their forces. May most of the time, it was just simply to escape the hell that was prison camps, whether North or South. It was anything to get out. I mean, you would do anything to get out of those conditions, literally anything. If you've ever read any books about those prison camps, whether Camp Douglas, Andersonville, you name it. So that's what's gonna be the motivating factor for most galvanized soldiers. Now, there is a relatively small number 
of galvanized soldiers compared to how many soldiers served in the, in the Civil War. About 5,600 Confederates galvanized throughout the Civil War. That's a very small number overall. And about 1,600 uh, Union are known to have gone the other way. Uh, most of them pressed or, or, or you know, really forced into it. But uh, it was pretty much coercion one way or the other, um, whether it just be the conditions of the POW camps. Uh, the exchanges broke down in early 63, as you know, prisoner exchanges. So that really pushed the envelope as well. Um, and that's when, you know, a lot of the um, galvanizing happened after that point. So swallowing the dog was the kind of the derogatory term for, for galvanizing, you know, because, you, you, you know, you have to, you know, make this huge, horrible uh, commitment to a cause that you don't agree with, uh, that you didn't sign up for. So it was called swallowing the dog. Uh, that's what they called galvanizing back then. And it's a little confusing when you research it because they called galvanized Yankees, uh, un Union soldiers that became Confederates were called galvanized Yankees, and so were Confederates that um, uh, galvanized to become Union. And so it got a, it, it's a little confusing. Both sides were incredibly wary, including General Grant, of their galvanized soldiers, of their loyalty. So they had 99 percent of, of, of Confederate galvanized uh, Union soldiers they were used in the Western outposts uh, to guard against uh, Native American attacks. And so that's where they were put so that they wouldn't, you know, one, desert or two, you know, actually defect, you know, back to the other forces again or what, whatever it may be. So, uh, for instance, in, in December of 64, uh, some, you know, galvanized Confederates unions that became Confederates actually threw down their arms, a whole group of 250 uh, and surrendered in the face of the Union charge. So uh, certainly these concerns were well-founded. General Grant uh, actually said in his opposition, he said, it's not right to expose them where to be taken prisoners, they might su surely suffer as deserters. So, so there's an, you know, it's the same idea as the, the African-American soldiers. There was an extra punishment that may be in store for them. In September, uh, Hugh is going to take the oath of allegiance, and he's going to join the Company E of the 3rd Maryland Cavalry. His recruiting officer is on the left, and does anybody, uh, his, his name is Captain Andrew J. Pemberton. And he's an interesting character because the, does anybody recognize the guy on the right? He's the uh, commander at Vicksburg. And uh, his name is uh, General John C. Pemberton. This is an interesting small world situation. So you've got the commander of Hugh Clemens' new company of the 3rd Maryland Cavalry of Galvanized Yankees. His brother other is the commander that surrendered to General Grant at Vicksburg. They both grew up in Philadelphia. For some reason, his brother went with the Confederacy. I don't know the whole story, and he went with the Union, obviously. Not that unusual. Grant's father-in-law was, you know, Southern Southerner and Confederate, and, and his brother-in-law, though, uh, was a uh, Union soldier. So it's certainly families, as you know, were split up by the war. A couple of individuals down at the um, uh, Fort Delaware Society uh, definitely helped a lot with the research, you know, on galvanized Yankees and specifically about the Company E of the 3rd Maryland Cavalry. What's going to be really interesting and, and incredibly unique about the Company E, 3rd Maryland Cavalry, uh, they proved everything right, as I'll mention, uh, the galvanized uh, Yankees couldn't be trusted, but uh, except if they're Yankee galvanized Yankees, we'll find that out. But they were the only Confederate galvanized Yankees, I should say, to ever see active combat service against other Confederates. So this smaller band company uh, actually saw service. The rest of them, again, all sent out west. So that's that makes Hugh's story another level of unique. And then we're going to, you know, obviously we're, we're, we're already at a, a very unique uh, position with his story. So at the same time that um, Hugh is joining up, uh, in September of 1863, his brother-in-law, Elijah, who they got separated at some point, um, he was picked up as a deserter by Union forces at Raccoon Ford in Virginia. He was held at a different prison, uh, Old Capitol Prison in Washington. Uh, he was given a chance the next spring, uh, next March in 64, he took the oath of allegiance and he couldn't return to Georgia, obviously, at this point. There was just no no way. So he, he, he um, joined his family and they show up in the census uh, back up in the Luzerne area in 65. We'll talk about what happens to him later, but he gets to go home. He doesn't join the Union. He, they just allow him to, to go back up north. I mean, things were really bad in southern Georgia at that point in 64. I mean, you're talking about 
you know, food riots, uh, with starving children, you know, Confederate deserters banding together and uh, hiding from authorities. It was really a bad scene uh, in Southern Georgia at that time. Uh, again, he's going to stay with the family up <clears throat> up in, in New York. You know, why was he allowed to go home? You know, why why was was Hugh, was given, Hugh given the same option? These are all interesting questions. Sadly, we find out, and I'm sure that uh, it was very sad uh, for Hugh when he found out that in August uh, of 61, Hugh's older brother, Martin Van Buren, uh, had, uh, st who had stayed back in Luzerne, he had joined the Company D of the 93rd uh, New York Infantry, uh, whose Lieutenant Colonel was actually uh, Benjamin Clapp Butler, not to be uh, confused with Beast Butler. He would later be instrumental in the development of, of Luzerne. He was a big, uh, you know, very important uh, person in the community. Hugh's brother died of disease in the fall of 62. It's very likely he didn't even know his brother had died until late in, later in the war, uh, probably after his capture, you know, it's later in 60, for a whole year, probably. He didn't even know his brother was dead. There's no evidence that he fought um, directly against his brother. However, uh, they were both units were on the field uh, at Antietam at the same time. Uh, so certainly they they were uh, you know close enough. <laughs> and uh, but sadly they'd never see each other again. And he's that's his burial. He's buried. Uh, goodness gracious, I'm trying to remember. Uh, but he's buried in a national cemetery, I think in Washington. I think he was brought back to Washington. So they decide to take the uh, 3rd Maryland Cavalry. Didn't have horses the whole time. That's the usual. And they brought, they took them down way, way down south. And uh, it did prove to be a bit of a uh, concern that, that their concerns were well-founded uh, because they even before they left Maryland, they had a 40% desertion rate among the galvanized Yankees. 40% just whoop, once, they, well, I, I don't know, once they marched out of the uh, the compound or wherever, they whoop, gone, 40% gone. They lost another 13% basically when they landed down in, in the South. So in all, over 200 of the 400 who took the old galvanized Yankees um, deserted. Obviously, Hugh was not one of them. The 3rd Maryland um, was also plagued by a lack of uh, structure and discipline, and they had a lot of infighting amongst the officers. And Ca Captain Pemberson would resign in, in June of 64. They engaged in the Red River campaign in, in 64. Uh, Hugh was assigned as a teamster and a laborer in the ordnance department. So he's doing uh, tasks that probably have him off the front lines, I would imagine, but a pretty heavy manual labor. So that summer of 64, uh, Admiral Farragut is going to, uh, he's intent on taking the Mobile Bay. And uh, one of his obstacles was Fort Morgan, and, and it was besieged in August, and, and the, the 3rd Maryland Cavalry took, took part in that siege. Uh, the defenses of the bay were largely captured, but Mobile itself, as some of you may know, actually held out to the very end of the war. So they're in Mobile Bay. Uh, he was going to be assigned uh, as a hospital attendant. He's going to at Fort Gaines nearby and for, on Dauphin Island uh, from August through uh, all the way through November. And uh, he, he, he received an assignment as a detached duty as an aide to a, um, me the medical purveyor, the Union Medical Purveyor Mobile. Uh, Mobile. So they're going to get the medical supplies for the, the, the Army. And so that's what he's going to be doing. That's, that's what he's going to be doing. And he stayed right in the, that, that office, that position, all the way until the end of the war and, and just a bit past until June of 65 and was mustered out in Vicksburg in September. Uh, of 1865. So the end, the the last, I guess the the time he spent in the Union, uh, although very hot and, and hard work, uh, was probably a little less terrifying than the two years he spent in the Confederate Army, uh, facing some of the most terrible battles of the Civil War. So Hugh is going to come home. He's going to come home. He's going to come right back to Luzerne. Uh, we can see him on the map in 1876, about a decade after the war. His parents are still alive. And he's living uh, nearby, uh, just north of the, the, the village of Luzerne. Wonder what it would have been like to be away for that many years. Been in the South for a few years, brother lost to the war, and having such a fantastic story to have to relate to your townspeople, people that knew you as a young man, and, and now you're totally changed. It seems like he was able to settle in well, though. As we know, not all veterans, and I do a program on veterans as well, because not all veterans adjusted well back to, to uh, civilian life especially ones that went into the war young. Uh, but for whatever reason, he, he seems to have done really well. Oddly enough, 
Elijah takes his family back down to Southern Georgia. Maybe he had property re to, to recover or whatever, but he stayed down in the South the rest of his life. Him and the family, they ended up dying in Florida. Hugh, however, was done with the South. He, he never went back. He stayed in Luzerne uh, the rest of his life. He could have received criticism for his time in the, um, in the army, but he, he didn't, um, that we know of. It seems like he was honest about his experience and, and his sincerity really won over the townspeople and they accepted him fully. He was a family man. Uh, he had uh, four children. Interestingly enough, his, his, one of his children actually uh, lived all the way till 1985. So he married Martha Stewart, not that one, uh, and started a family. They had three daughters and a son, uh, as I mentioned. He became a successful businessman and well-respected member of the local community. He was very active in politics, oddly enough, a Democrat <laughs> in that time, uh, when a lot of uh, most Civil War veterans were Republicans. I should say Union veterans, sorry. He was actually a, a Democratic pro and Prohibition candidate for town supervisor in 1896. So he's he's got a, a hardware store. He's a businessman. He's he's very active in, in uh, all sorts of civic and community uh, organizations, fraternal organizations, uh, obviously just well, uh, well received and well loved in his community, despite his service in the Confederate Army, because that was a disqualifier to join the Grand Army, if, if you know the rules. He actually was allowed to join the Benjamin C. Butler, post number 316 uh, of the Grand Army of the Public. His wife, Martha, was an auxiliary, uh, active in the Women's Relief Corps Auxiliary, and Hugh served as Secretary of the Warren County um, Veterans Association as well. He was with the uh, Odd Fellows, Ancient Order of the United Workmen. In 1890, there's, he, he has an ad out in a national paper looking for other members of the 3rd Maryland Cavalry. Uh, who knows if he ever you know, got tried to get any together to correspond with or talk about old times. So those are all the many things he, he was involved in in his community. Uh, again, accepted into the uh, Butler Post. Uh, the original book still uh, is scanned in and exists. Um, of the uh, Butler Post and, and his name's right in it. He served as an officer at times. So how does Hugh Clemens' uh, life inter, you know, intersect with the, the life of Ulysses S. Grant? Well, all this big national, international drama of Grant trying to finish his memoirs on a mountaintop is happening just 10 miles away from his home. And every person, American, would have known about it, but every, it was in the papers everywhere, but Hugh would have really known about it because he was a veteran. Uh, so the veterans, the Grand Army were preparing. They knew he was dying. They were preparing to be part of the ceremonies. Uh, and that's where he's going to have an interaction. So Hugh and a few, a few hand-picked men from the Butler Post GAR are gonna be detailed in as an honor guard in Saratoga Springs uh, during the funeral procession. Uh, they place Grant's body on a train going off the mountain down to Saratoga, they switch trains in Saratoga, and that's where Hugh Clemens is going to be standing. You can see there's there's actually a resolution of respect in the paper. It's actually signed Hugh Clemens there, or marked Hugh Clemens, just after Grant's death in July of 1885. And there's actually a photograph. Is Hugh in it? Possibly, probably, because that's the actual small mountain train, and they're going to transfer Grant's body over to the train on the right, the larger train, to get him down to New York City. And he was going to be in that crowd somewhere. He's one of the uh, honor guard for this uh, for this portion of Grant's trip, a few miles south uh, of the mountain in Saratoga Springs. So the man who had once donned gray was donning blue, uh, and he was there to see off the greatest hero of the Union. Uh, Hugh himself, his sister and brother-in-law passed away in 1891-92 and are buried um, they had moved to Orlando, Florida. Oddly enough, a Confederate mar uh, marker is next to Elijah's grave. Whether or not he requested that or even wanted it there, I don't know. Um, but that's interesting as well. Hugh died in a hospital in Albany, New York of cancer on de Decoration Day, uh, now that we know as Memorial Day weekend in 1910. He was buried in Luzerne Cemetery uh, with full honors. Uh, his wife died in 1922. And, and as I mentioned, his youngest child lived Ted lived until 1985. And uh, when I was giving this talk at Luzerne, uh, there was a, a family member, a, a descendant that actually uh, had met uh, Ted when he was still alive. And I'll leave you with a newspaper clipping here of Hugh Clemens. Uh, and again, it's always, you know, a little gushing with these obituaries and messages, but it seems like this is fairly heartfelt. Hugh Clemens has gone, but the influence of his upright life, his sterling character and public spirit will live after him. 
his high and unyielding sense of honor, integrity, and righteousness, his quick perception, sound judgment, and splendid foresight always gave value to his counsel for the present and future good of the community. Without deliberately looking backward through the years of his active, vigilant, and influential connection with the affairs of this village of ours, we fully comprehend and appreciate his distinguished service to his fellow men. Surely Luzerne has lost one of her most manly men. That's from the local newspaper, the Warrensburg News. So certainly he was, he was loved, beloved in his community. He was a, a pillar of his community after he came back. So the traumatic experiences he, he went through, um, being pressed into the Confederate service, uh, witnessing the horrors of war, he was still able to put that behind him and, and, and live a very fulfilling and, 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 and very meaningful life for, you know, helping his community. I always got to, you know, end, but I got to end with a little pitch. Uh, it, we're not too far out of the way. Uh, there's lots of history to see in the Saratoga area. So I do invite you to come and see us. Uh, we're open and probably Memorial Day this year. We've got some construction going on, but we have uh, probably Memorial Day is when we'll open and we will be open until through October uh, of 2023. And we hope that you'll be able to come and experience the cottage. It's a really special place, beautiful views, uh, amazingly preserved history in the cottage um, and a great visitor center and displays as well. Uh, but again, the setting is, uh, is, 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 is absolutely stunning. Um, so I definitely recommend that. Uh, and of course, we have more information on our website, grantcottage.org. Uh, one last thing I'll show you is I, I mentioned this to Al um, before. I did find a, I, I got this from auction. I just picked it up because it was a veterans item. <clears throat> and it turns out it says post number five, Department of Massachusetts. That would have been the, the General Lander post. So this individual actually has ties to your wonderful museum, which I hope to see at some point there, the GAR Hall in Lynn. Don't know who it is for sure. I found somebody that seems to fit the bill, but there's some problems with it. Uh, it is a Smith name, so that's an issue, but this is a calling a business card, calling card of O.H. Smith. Uh, there is an Ogden H. Smith who has an interesting story, and he was a deserter and, and had a hard time getting a pension, but he, he's listed as being a member of the Grand Army Lander Post number five. So hopefully uh, Al said he'd take a look at the records and see if we could maybe pin this guy down, because Ogden Smith is from, I think, West Newberry, and, and this other one is Lemonster. I got it right, Lemonster. North Lemonster, Massachusetts, right? Um, and so, you know, that's a little mystery. And if it's something that the um, museum would like to have in their collection, I'm fully willing to donate that as well. Mm -hmm.